that it is. How are you doing? Woo! Yeah, that's how you do it. Uh, well, first of all, may I kick off taking a picture of all of us? Are you done, Fred? All right, so everyone, smile. Yay! Nice. So I would like to kickstart this with a round of applause for PJ and Johnny because they are able to put that together. So give them a round of applause, please. Hey. Good job, dude. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. So I know we had a bunch of great talks already, and uh, I'm one of the last ones, so you're kind of probably tired as I am as well. So I try to keep this dynamic and try to move around a little bit. I hope to get no one bored. Uh, Let's get it started. So, 90% 90% of passwords are trackable within 6 hours. Freaking 90%. <laughs> and if that's not enough, 65% six, six, of people use the same password everywhere. And then that's probably your good pleasure as well, because I do have some passwords in some places. But uh, the true fact is that most of people uh, don't care about their passwords. They care about security, but they don't care about passwords at all, and that's a problem. And that's the thing, like, we are developers. Uh, we are developing a bunch of applications, and a bunch of APIs and systems and all kinds of shit that uh, we need to take care of this kind of shit for people because we need to take that burden so they don't have to. And we start to think in this true. But before talking about authentication itself and all the technical aspects of it and how we can uh, tackle that in Elixir and also with Phoenix, I would like to go through some uh, cool stuff that I read uh, on my way of prepping this talk. How many of you have ever seen uh, this kanji? All right, awesome. So this kanji, and correct, don't correct me, but forget it, like forgive me if I'm wrong, uh, it's I think from Shoji, probably it, and um, it's very used in Buddhism and also in some Japanese martial arts. And I do like what it represents. It means beginner's mind. And I love this concept of beginner's mind. I have been using it over and over. And uh, I think instead of trying to explain what it is, I will give you a simple test for all of you, right? So you probably have done this already in the past, but uh, it's a very good, good concept. Uh, I show you a couple of lines. And the question is, which line is longer? but they have the same size, right? That's the trick thing. This time they doesn't have the same size. They have different sizes. <laughs> Yay! So I treated all of you, and that's exactly what happens. That's what this concept is about. As we grow as developers, as we learn more stuff, as we go into different technologies and start learning about different things, we become experts and like conflict that we know how things are supposed to work. And we end up being triggered by things like this because Rules can change, and rules will change as time passes. And that's exactly what has happened in the technology market right now. Not only the tax changing, but also the users are changing. They're expecting different things from your application, and different things from the way that you develop things. Uh, and I'm not talking only about all those new languages. I mean, those are the new languages from the past 20 years, I would say, uh, maybe even more than that. So you probably see someone that you know here, like Haskell, Lisp, Smalltalk, Ruby, Python, Java, Perl, and other stuff. But uh, not only the technology is changing, uh, the language and the features that comes with it, but also the tech around that, and how that is depending on authentication and depending on web technologies. And I'm not talking only about cell phones that doesn't explode in your pockets. I'm also talking about, like, Drone delivery, like Amazon has been trying, uh, also about virtual reality, and also some also uh, IoT stuff. So we have all these new bunch of tech that is taking advantage and that is being empowered by web technologies and web authentication process. And we need to also be aware of what is the next level when we talk about authentication that we cover also these new technologies. Uh, so. I mean, it's not only a matter of that, but also uh, about the things that have been going on lately. We have been a lot of security breaches. Like, you can see like Twitter, you can see like Evernote, LinkedIn, all those companies have a bunch of like IT people only devoted for security. And uh, that, that has been a major issue for the people nowadays. Not only security, but how you handle with breaches that you might have. And that 
can represent a big impact on a small company as well. I'm not only talking about like Twitter and all those big companies, I'm also talking about your next $1 million app or your next $1 million idea. I mean, uh, there are some researches that point that small bridges and authentication problems can provoke a huge gap on your money uh, if you end up not reading that right. So, my name is Joel Moda. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Backlink, a company based in Berkeley. Uh, how many of you have heard about Backlink? Oh, quite a few of you, probably because of the open positions that we have. Uh, if you have interest in those, you may also talk with me or shoot me a Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to talk with me. That is my handle and that's how you can find me in almost every social network ever. Uh, and today we are going to talk about how to tackle authentication with Phoenix. So, uh, what we hope to accomplish here is to put on some light on how authentication works right now and uh, give it like some food to talk about how we should work in the future and some libraries that has been around Elixir that can help you to achieve that and take your application to the next level, right? The thing is when we talk about authentication, uh, all those questions start to come to you. Whoa. Sorry about that. So when you talk about authentication, all those questions start to pop in. Like, ah, but what about the usability? Uh, what about like delegate? Maybe I should delegate it to a third app, uh, third third party servers or whatever. Uh, should I implement like single sign-on or not? Or maybe I should uh, do that into a microservice? And, and all those questions start to come in. And I don't think that's even the biggest problem in the like in the room. I mean, we have to take a step back and have the other stuff that comes before that that is actually how authentication works and what is the difference between two main words that is authentication and authorization. And we're going to talk about both, both of them in this talk. Uh, I'm going to kickstart with the authentication one. So authentication is a concept that I divided here in two different strategies. The first strategy is the one that we are most used to that is based on something that you know. So it can be like an ID, it can be a password, it can be a secret key, it can be a secret question. Uh, all those things that you know, and if someone asks you, you can reply to those. But, um, and that works pretty well for most of, the, most of the applications around, as long as no one knows your password, or you don't pick a silly one, <coughs> like, the, like this man that I love. But uh, we do have a password problem nowadays. I mean, people don't recall their passwords. We just have gone through all those numbers and all those statistics around uh, password issues. That is a problem. But even though that's one, of, one way of authenticating our users, and we have great libraries around uh, the Elixir ecosystem that can help you with that, like coherence. Uh, how many of you come from Ruby or are from Ruby? And how many of you use Rails or use it Rails? And how many of you use a device? Got it. So the device for those that doesn't know is a pretty famous authentication library in the Ruby community. It was also developed by Formatech, the company from Zavali that created an Elixir. So you can definitely see the relation here. Uh, and uh, coherence is basically the same thing for, for Phoenix. And I'm not the one that's saying that. They are the one that's saying that. And uh, they do work pretty much the same thing. And they are this huge library with a bunch of options and boilerplate code that you can bring to your app and build something like get something up and running pretty quickly. And that's really cool, and that's enabled you to do a lot of good stuff. And it's under active development, so I think we're in this phase where you still don't have like a bunch of established libraries that you can default to, but that's definitely one of the big concurrents, uh, con one of the big contexts in, in this area. So you're gonna have like, uh, yeah, you're gonna be able to implement like a, register, uh, a way to use it to register, to be invited, to remember the password, and all this stuff out of the blue. And it's pretty easy to install, actually. All you have to do is run, like, mix coherence install, and it will, like, do everything for you. It will create the models, it will create the views, it will create the migrations, everything that you need. And that works pretty well. And I mean, uh, I kind of like the way that the things work in this kind of libraries, but uh, I do not like the fact that it all becomes a black box because you don't actually know what is going on inside of it. And that's one of the major problems with Rails, right? Because a lot of developers know how to code or develop in Rails, but they don't actually know how to develop in Ruby. They don't know the difference between a regular model and a model with uh, all the stuff that, agree, that comes on with active record, active model, and everything. So that's one of the problems that the Ruby community have. 
and uh, I think that the Elixir community doesn't have ways to have. So the bad thing about this kind of library is that it comes with everything back inside, and you don't really know how things work. But on the other hand, it enables you to get, uh, to, to get out of the floor really quickly and get things up and running. So that can be a huge motivation if you're trying to grasp something new. I would recommend you to get your hands dirty and give it a try, uh, so you can get like some instant gratification, and then you can move on into implementing your own stuff or figuring out how things work. Uh, another great library uh, is Uberout. By the way, uh, is Shaw in the room? Shaw, am I pronouncing his name right? Maybe I'm not. Uh, I don't think. He, he is one of the folks that I brought with me to Uberout. Uh, I mean, we have talked uh, a lot online, and I was supposed to map him in the conference, but we haven't met yet. So I hope that I met him after my talk. So Uberout, how many of you have heard about it before? Nice. It's like OmniWall for Ruby. It basically enables you to have a flexible authentication system, and it works pretty simple. Um, it's based for plugin-based applications, so you may not only use that with Phoenix, but other kind of applications as well. Um, and it aims to tackle only the first part of the challenge, that is authentication. It doesn't care about authorization, it just cares about getting your user credentials validated, make sure that he's right, and from there on you can move on by using another library or doing it yourself. Uh, and I do like that because it's aiming to soak one, one simple problem. In order to do that, it divides the authentication process in two phases. The first phase is what we call the request phase. So the request phase is the phase where you uh, ask for the user information. And that can help through a uh, usual web form, or you can also do that to an OAuth integration by integrating with Facebook, like GitHub, whatever, you name it. Uh, and once that you get that information, you go to the second phase, that is the callback phase, where you actually validate that information and then sign in the user or not. And the good thing about doing that is because it's standard, it, it tries to set a standard for how those things works, and it wraps it up in something called strategies, and then it enables you to use like plug and play strategies as you want. So if you do go to like Uberauf, GitHub page, you're gonna see all these sort of integrations that you can use out of the box. Uh, they're called the, the, they're called strategies because they have made a standard on how to do that. So you're gonna have find integrations to Facebook, Foursquare, GitHub, Google, Instagram, whatever, you name it. There's a bunch of those like ready. So I do think that brings the the better to both words. So you can also can get like uh, something up and running really quickly but we, it's not something that's big enough that you don't know what's going on. So I think overall might be a better strategy than go for coherence, but uh, it's up to you actually. So back to the strategies that we have when we're talking about authentication. The first one was something that you know, and that's what we we're talking about. And the second one is something that you have, uh, also as known as magical login links. So it can be like a cell phone, a physical key, uh, if you have logged into Slack recently, you're going to realize that that's the way they're, they're moving forward. So once that you put your email, they ask you for, or you put your password, or uh, if you want to send, if, they want, if you want them to send you a uh, login link, and you can just copy whatever is the login link, and that's going to log you in uh, automatically. So you don't even have to have a password anymore. And that's awesome, because we definitely have a password problem. So that eventually will help you into, into also get logged in really quickly. And we have good libraries around that on Elixir. So we have this library called POT. I don't know if it's POT or POT, but uh, it's similar to another Ruby library called ROTP. It's basically a Erlang library for generating one-time passwords. It can generate passwords based on key hash authentication code or, uh, or time-based authentication code. It's up to you. And it's really good because it's, it works really simple and it is also compatible with uh, Google Authenticator. So if you use like two-step authentication on Heroku or GitHub, you probably have this app installed already. And that's one of the things that our users are getting used to, is to have two-step authentication. So they already have this app. That might be a good strategy. Uh, the way that the, the library works is very simple. It basically takes a secret that your application knows, maybe some sort of user information if you want like um, one token per user, and also the current time so you can uh, for example, get the actual data minute that we are right now, and then that will result in a token that, it, um, that you're gonna, it's going to be valid for this minute. 
so this is, this is actually how you would do that with the library itself. So we have a secret, and then you call TOTP on, on the POT library, and that will generate the secret for you. And you can also validate the secret uh, by using the valid TOTP uh, method function on the, on the POT library. That's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's supposed to be really simple, and you can definitely implement something from yourself going from there. But the good stuff is when you mix the both, what you have with what you know, and then you end up with what we call uh, mood factor authentication, or as I like to call, uh, getting away with a shitty password. And that's really good because that solves one of the problems that we have, that is the, this whole password situation that are going on right now. And I would recommend you to give it a try to that. And all right, I think we, 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 got, we are talking a little bit about authentication. Now it's time to talk about the second word, that's authorization. So authorization is different from authentication because it's not about making sure that it's a valid user with valid credentials. It's about keeping like the new requests that are coming through, checking if those are valid, and if the user should be able to access the information that is requesting or not. But in order to do that, we need to understand a little bit about how people think that authentication works nowadays. And uh, I came up with a good, uh, a good diagram that I think that explains that very well. So basically you have a client and you have a server and it all starts as a joke, like, hey, knock knock. And then the server replies, so who is there? And you say like, it's me. And you say, okay, thanks. And that's pretty much how most of people think authentication works. But uh, in order to keep information exploring from one question to another, you have to have state, right? You have to save that, that thing in somewhere. And that's why we start using sessions and cookies in order to save that information, not only the, the user information in the server, but also in the cookie to store the reference for the session and also all the information for that user. So we end up using those two things that a lot of developers hate, and a little, like just a few of developers know how it actually works, in order to try to keep stateful authentication. But the thing is that HTTP is a stateless protocol, so it's not supposed to keep state over different requests. So how, how should we implement authentication then? And uh, this is basically how that would be implemented. So you have a client and you have a server and whenever you say a new request, you say that it's you. So knock knock, by the way, it's me. So I'm saying that it's you right from the beginning and I'm saying who, who are, who am I every time that I do a new request for you. Uh, and the server then is going to decide if you should have access to that information that you're requesting or not and send a response based on that. And there's a good too around that. Uh, how many of you have heard, heard about JSON Web Tokens? Oh, nice. So yeah, JSON Web Tokens is something that uh, a standard, like an open standard for changing information. So you can change information using like a JSON hash in, some more sec in a more secure way. And there are some people that are proposing using that as a dedication process. And I do believe that is actually a good call. So, um, Basically, it's a digital object that you can send through like a post or the URL itself or even as an HTTP header, it's up to you. And this is how it looks like. You have three parts. You have a header, you have a payload, and you also have a signature. And um, that's how they look like. The header basically contains, uh, the header basically contains two kinds of stuff. So the algorithm that you're using to compile the whole thing and um, also the type of the token that you have. In this case, is a JSON Web Token. The payload can include, can include all sorts of information. It has some of the full parameters, like the suit one, that um, is, is to indicate what is the record identifier that you can find that on your database or in your server, whatever. And you can have custom information there, like the name or an admin flag. You choose it. And the last part is the signature. It's basically a mix from the both information above together with a secret. And this is what you end up with. Uh, you still can see the three information in there, so you still have the header, the payload, and the signature in there, and that works pretty well. And then you can send that as an HTTP header or whatever request that you do. So HTTP, craft, HTTP headers basically enable you to do that. That's why they exist. And the recommendation for you is to use the authorization HTTP header to send this information uh, back and forth. And there's a lot of great benefits by doing that. So basically, you're going to start to have a stateless authentication mechanism because you don't need to keep that information, so you might not even need a cookie. And because you don't need a cookie, you won't have like cross-origin with search sharing errors, 
and that's a good thing if you're aiming to develop like a web app or maybe have access for a group of different clients or maybe trying to tackle single sign-on, that might be really helpful for you. Uh, the user states never saved in memory. And another good stuff is that it might reduce the number of calls that you have to do in the database because keep in mind that JSON Web Tokens also have a payload, so you might also save information in there. So you don't have to go to the database in order to get the information back again once that you already have that on the HTTP header. So this is basically how that would work out in practice. So you have a client and you have our server. Your client do a, a request to sign in a user, and this is where uh, the first part comes in. So we're going to have like Uber Alf or uh, Coherence doing his stuff, just to make sure that the user is valid and therefore the credentials are valid as well. And then it creates the the JSON Web Token. So it will get their header, it will get the payload. In this case, my name and I'm an admin and uh, it will to compile with everything using a secret that is the biggest secret ever. So once you do that, that's the JSON Web Token that will generate, and that will send that back to the client uh, so that the browser can save that somewhere else. Uh, some people use a local storage for that, some people want to use Scoop for that, it's up to you, but there are some differences on uh, the benefits that you can get from the And then from there on, every time that the clients do a new request, it sends that JSON Web Token as the header. So whenever it receives that, it checks the signature of that token by separating the signature from the rest uh, and trying to put the secret again and generate the same signature once again. That prevents that someone that is watching the request tries to sneak in some information that wasn't supposed to be in there. Because they can change the two first parts of the JSON Lab token to add new parameters as they want, but they can't generate the signature again because they know the secret. So your, you can always validate to see if that secret is valid and therefore if there's someone trying to sneak in some information that you don't actually want in your app. So that's a good thing about JSON Web Tokens and there's a lot of good frameworks that are moving in that direction. So as far as I know, Ember is one of the famous JavaScript frameworks that are moving in that direction to implement JSON Web Tokens into their structure as well. And then you got back to the send the response to client and everything moves on as expected. In order to do that in your Elixir project or in your Phoenix, Phoenix app, there is a great, uh, great library called Guard. How many of you have heard about Guard? Nice. So Guard is developed by the same, the same people that are working on Uberoff. So I would say that you definitely should probably try to mix those up together. What Guard does is basically the second part that we are discussing, the authorization part. It doesn't care how you authenticate the user, if the credentials are valid or not. The only thing it does is, is generate JSON web, JSON web tokens, it validates JSON web tokens, and give you back the information that is inside of it. So it's very simple to use. Basically, all you have to do is call the sign in function on it, and it will return the new token for you. Uh, this is actually how a function, a login function, would looks like. So you have like this boilerplate function called confirm password that can be anything like Uber Alpha, coherence, you name it. And uh, once that's valid, and then call the guardian plug sign in function. Uh, and it will sneak in on the JSON Web Token in the request, and you are finding from there. Uh, on the other hand, you might add a pipeline into your routes by including two plugs, the verify session and the load resource. Uh, they are basically responsible for getting the JSON Web Token back for every request validate if that's still valid or not, and get the information back so that you can use that without doing another request database. And then you can just add this pipeline to whatever house that you want. So that's basically how, how Guard is supposed to work and help on the authorization process. I do believe there's a lot of other great libraries, I mean you have Canary to handle those, like if you have multiple levels of authorization, and other amazing libraries in Elixir that you can check that can help you out to tackle this problem. But I do think that like mixing up both, like some sort of JSON Web Token, and you can choose to use Guard for it or not, and also Uber Alpha for coherence, or maybe you wrote your own stuff for authentication, is a good solution that you enable you to have a safe login process, a safe authentication process, and you can use that as API for whatever project that you want. Uh, before talking about other stuff, I would like to wrap up this part. So, wrapping it up really quickly, we talk about everything that we talk about education right now. I think there are four main points that we need to keep uh, if this talks 
if you're going to remember anything from this talk, you need to remember at least those four things. The first one is that we have a password problem. People are forgetting the passwords, people are using the same passwords, uh, people are having like their passwords stolen, they are using like unsafe connections and everything. And we need to worry about that and we need to take that burden for them. The second one is that we should start embracing which factor authentication. Uh, it looks like it might not help, it looks like it, it can like decrease our conversion, conver conversion rates, but it can actually help us to achieve success because that's not something that's fancy, but it's something that users are moving on to and they're kind of expecting you to have multi-factor authentication so you can have a more secure authentication process. So that might be a good thing for you to give it a try. Other thing is that stateless authentication is a thing. So you don't have to keep using sessions and cookies every now and then. You can try to explore new words and if you decide to do that, JSON Web Tokens might be a great solution for you and I would totally recommend you to check that out because that might be really helpful. The fourth point is there is a great there are a lot of great leaps around Elixir. I mean, uh, we discussed uh, three of them here, but I do believe there is a lot more than that, and maybe space for even more libraries to come in and fill in the gaps, like for the multi-factor authentication thing. So I would totally recommend you to not only check that out, but get involved in the subject as well. So for those that doesn't know, you might have noticed that I'm, I'm not American. I came from I'm not North American at least. Uh, I came from Brazil, so Brazil is a great place by the way, I love it, and you should definitely show up in there and let me know so that we can hang out. Uh, this is the, like, the trip that I made to come here to talk to you, I think it was pretty far, I mean I have done the worst, but it works pretty well, and I'm pretty happy to meet out you all, and I would like to do some uh, invites for you. The first invite is that all this talk began when I decided that I, I wanted to contribute to the community. And I was thinking about uh, how multi-factor authentication is something that we should care more. So I started my own library that I decided to not talk in this talk, that is called Keeper. Um, I decided to not talk about it because it's a pretty early stage. But I'm definitely calling you all to be good Elixir developers and help me out with that. So what I'm, aim uh, what I'm aiming with the Keeper is basically implement multi-factor authentication in an easy way. Maybe, in, maybe even integrate that with guards to use JSON Web Tokens and Uber Auth to handle authentication itself. So I think that might be something that will play out with both. And if you guys want to contribute and do more Elixir in your free time, or maybe uh, would factor authentication something that is easier for your company, you can definitely go there and help me out creating issues, checking out, giving your opinions. I mean, uh, it's, it's an open source project. You can do whatever you want. I would be glad to discuss that further with you online. Another thing is that I have started this series of articles called Learn Elixir with a Rubist. Uh, what is funny because Johnny has a similar series of articles and was actually working on a book that I'm not sure if he's still working on or not, that had a similar title that is Learn Elixir by a Rubist, I think, I'm not sure. But yeah, uh, so I start this series of articles on my blog. Uh, if you like to check that, or if you have some friends that do Ruby, that are trying to wrap their head around Elixir, I would definitely recommend you to check that out. We are four articles in already. Uh, it's probably around, in total, uh, 20 minutes reading for our articles. So I do recommend you to share that because a lot of people are giving me great feedback around that. And that might be a good thing. Uh, well, I would like to end saying that it's a pleasure for me to be here and to talk to you about education. So it's a subject that I'm really interested about. Um, and I hope to talk to you all later in the conference. Thank you.